Welcome to Drive for Service, a podcast to inspire a higher quality of service. A very warm welcome to our next episode of Drive for Service podcast. I'm Amy Morant and I'm here with my good friend David O'Connor of 14 years, co-owner of Medler Restaurant in Chelsea. Hello everyone. Now David and I have worked for many years in customer service, most of those in restaurants and together. And David has always driven the team to deliver an outstanding level of service. So we're here today to discover from the industry's best how they deliver a level of service that isn't just good, but that Next level, I would say, wouldn't wouldn't you, David? Absolutely. So would you like to introduce our guests today? I'm delighted to welcome today Sergio Rebecca and Natasha Robinson from Serenata Hospitality. Welcome. Welcome. Thank yeah. you so much. Lovely it's to lovely be to here. Be here. Yeah. Ah, very nice. Can we start with your career story, how you started in this industry? Yeah, absolutely. Why don't you yes. kick off? I suppose it really, it's, uh, I just regard it as uh, delivery memories really what hospitality means to me. And it all really starts going back to where I grew up. I, I grew up in a farming family, a large farming family. And um, it was really the level of hospitality that my uh, grandparents gave to the guests when they came. Uh, it was about learning about the amazing products that our region produced. I'm from Emilia, Romagna. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we have some incredible products. So it was appreciating what was the best of the best. It was also understanding that when it came to wine, we didn't produce good wines. So that was also a learning lesson. Uh, but memories were made up of uh, the uh, standard of cooking that my family, my aunts, my grandmother prepared. And when we had festivals, uh, normally a saint's day or a wedding or an anniversary, and loads of people would come to the to the farm, and I could witness. I think I was about three or four, but I remember th- that I would witness the preparation. The mise en place was about. I would learn later on uh, of um, food being prepared and the the care uh, that was put into the, the and the passion of cooking the food, and then when guests came, they felt so welcome, and it was um, a nitus that my family had, that whoever came to the farm would be well received, no matter who it was. Um, or no matter how much you had, they gave everything, didn't they? Always? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a good point because we, 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 we had vagrants who would visit us about two or three times a year on their travels to nowhere. Mm-hmm. And wherever they came to the farm, uh, they were always welcome and they were always given a meal and we always checked on them for the night's sleep. Uh, if they were okay, and then in the morning they would set off normally before I got up. So by the time I woke up, they'd gone. I loved the vegans because they had wonderful stories, mm-hmm. and it just made me dream. You know, it was a different world I didn't understand. Um, that was my uh, paternal side. My maternal side I had a smaller farm, and um, but a very large family, and they had actually they had eleven children, a football team. Uh, most most of them, uh, they had grew the, the farm, so they emigrated. Uh, had an aunt who came to England, uh, an uncle who went to Argentina, another aunt who went to France, another uncle who went to Belgium. So uh, these people uh, came to, came back every year to visit the family, uh, and of course they filled me with stories of faraway places, um, of. Uh, um, Sometimes they, they would bring me back some sporting kit because they knew I was very interested in sport. And it, it made me dream. And it created memories for me that I wanted to eventually explore. And little did I know that throughout life, most of these memories and the thing that I learned uh, would become true. I would experience them themselves. And um, at the age that I am now, it's very pleasing to be in a position whereby you beginning to create memories for other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suppose that that was the start of uh, of uh, hospitality. I don't know what hospitality meant at the time, but experiencing now the generosity of spirit and and the welcome and making people happy. And when people went, left the house, they felt, wow, that was good. What an amazing food. But 
what amazing company. That was very important for me. Then as I grew up and, and, and went to school, I, I was very interested in football. Football was my passion. My, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my father was desperate for me to help him when I was off school, but I ran away to play football. Uh, I captained a, a young team uh, in my town, and I was so lucky to have uh, 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 the assistant priest of the parish, Don Filippo, who uh, used to do used to teach us religion at school, religious studies, but also he was a football manager. <laughs> and uh, this man that's the kind of priest you need yes. <laughs> this man was just incredible because he was uh, over six foot tall uh, extremely good looking uh, as I'd learned afterwards because the women in town were very fond of the of the cure <laughs> all the mums encouraged their sons to go and, to football yeah. <laughs> and, my, and my recollection is of uh, of him doing training sessions with up on the football pitch and he would lift up his black robes and run after the ball and take the ball. And I still have this picture in my mind. But most importantly, he instilled the um, teamwork uh, in all of us. And uh, in particular, uh, we thought we were quite good. And we suppose we were quite good with the small team around us. But he had, um, he had a friend who happened to manage the youth team of AC Milan. So um, one day he said to us, look, you know, next summer, AC Milan, this friend of mine is going to bring their team over to us on a visit and I'll arrange a, a match for you. So we were very excited, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we had this first match and they, they came on a coach. So how old are you at this point? I am uh, 10. Okay, 10, 10 right? Okay. 10. Uh, so we were very excited. And uh, so they came and they all had beautiful uh, uh, um, uh, obviously, foot, football proper boots, kit, yeah. proper, proper kit. Mm. And we were just a ragdoll made, made up kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we played. So we played against them and we thought we were very good, but uh, we got beaten quite badly, I think 3 1 or 4 1. <laughs> so it didn't end very well. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, the, the Similan coach brought us a present, and the present was a football kit for all of us. Oh, the nice. second strip, which I, was incredible to have. So time went by, and then the following year, uh, Don Filippo said, look, I think it's they've asked for a rematch. Uh, are you happy to have a rematch? <laughs> and this is what we've been waiting for. <laughs> and um, So they clearly didn't think you were that bad a team to play. Oh, but if they wanted a rematch, perhaps you know? they just thought they'll beat yeah. us again. Mm. <laughs> <We'll> <laughs> Easily. Show these Easily. Yeah. Again. Easily. Mm. So they Don't came. Yeah. <laughs> they came, and this time we had, we had time to work on some minor tactics, but also to be a little bit humble, not to be as, as bullshit as we were at first, uh, that we thought we were unbeatable. And as the match went on, the whole team played extremely well. We had, we had a goalkeeper who was only about, uh, I don't know, uh, one meter 40, one meter 50. So in a, in a, in a goal mouth, is that's very small. But he was just uh, reaching for every ball. Um, I played in defense. I played, I remember I played well, but everyone played well. And we won 4 1. So I under, the feeling afterwards of winning was just the exhilaration was great. But what was really pleasing, was the team effort that mm. what Don Filippo had done mm. in his yeah. wisdom was to let's bring this team down to the let's <laughs> teach them a bit but it's not about individual it's about teamwork Quite. I'm mentioning this because all of these memories are lasting and when you in life they come back to you and then you remember them and you think ah that mm. was the message yeah. which perhaps wasn't apparent at the time um, and also, it sounds like uh, you playing a very, very good team as yes. well. It shows you that level of excellence that the team could achieve, and you clearly did achieve it the second time yes, round. So. Yes, yes. And what you can achieve with teamwork. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I remember that um, the following week, uh, Don Filippo, uh, uh, he said he wanted to speak to me. He said, you know, uh, you, you very much impressed the, uh, the, the coach. 
Yeah. And he wondered whether you'd be interested in going to Milan to have a, a trial. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yes, uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I didn't go. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't really interested. Okay. Uh, mostly because I felt so attached to my teammates. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if he, if they had asked the team to go, that would have been great. But I just felt that as an individual, I just didn't feel comfortable. I suppose that was a trait of my formation in life, which is mm. a, a trait that I'm happy with and I enjoy. Also, he's a Juventus supporter, so <laughs> he wouldn't go to Milan. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> See, fair enough. Makes sense. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so pretty much, that, that, that was that. And then my, uh, one of my aunt uh, had a business in, in London. Um, she had a restaurant in Shepherd's Market. Mm-hmm. And uh, she came to retire in age and uh, she encouraged my father, well, she bullied my father into taking over the restaurant. <laughs> so my father moved to, the, my parents moved to the UK and I finished my high school and I went into Catherine College. And um, um, then Juventus again <laughs> bought this amazing player, um, the best player I've ever seen to this day. Uh, his name is John Charles. Uh, uh, Welsh. He was, was he English, no. Welsh. Welsh. Ah. Mm. Uh, he was a centre forward, also played as a centre half. Mm-hmm. His brother Mel Charles also played played for Arsenal, my other my other team. Um, and he came for he came to Juventus, and I think um, he was he was an amazing player because he never got booked in his career. Five hundred thirty six matches, never got booked. He was wow. a fantastic head of the ball. He was a uh, uh, they used to call him a gentle John because he was kind in his play. If it fall, if he, if he committed a foul unwittingly because of his posture, he would stop the play and pick up the man. Mm. He, he, he was a one-off. But why I'm saying this is because uh, by then he had left Juventus. I think he stayed with us two or three years. He went back to play for Leeds. So I just wanted to come to, come to the UK because I wanted to go to Leeds to play. I had no idea where Leeds was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... So I came. I came back to visit. I came back to visit my my uh, my parents, and then find out how far Leeds was. So I never got to Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, so these are formative years, and and the the um, um, the experiences that that one has, and the memories that were created in a certain aspect, then carried on because at, at college. Um, I had again another incredible mentor, uh, and he uh, at the end at the end of this college, the, it was catering and tourism. So at that time, I was quite interested in being a tourist guide because it brought me places, got to meet new people. Bit of travel, yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Uh, but uh, uh, then I realized that perhaps I don't know, it might not happen. But so I came to the UK, and. Uh, so where uh, did you go to catering college? I was in in, in northern Italy, okay, northern where, Italy. where I come yeah, from. Yeah. Yes, and um, the the head of the college had a friend in the UK, mm-hmm. and uh, um, I didn't think I did particularly well at the, at the college. I think I was a bit lazy. I was a bit too big headed, I think. But he saw something in me, and he said, "Look, uh, I think you've done very well. Uh, I have arranged for you uh, a prize, a trip." astonishing so he arranged for me a trip to go to the Berg in Geneva then I went to the Dom in Cologne George V in Paris and then the Cumberland in London uh, wow what a trip <laughs> lovely yeah. Yeah. so I stayed I stayed two months in each hotel uh, fantastic and it was really the first time I experienced different cultures uh, different languages I didn't speak a word of English mm. I studied French at school so it was eye-opening. And when I came to the... I didn't really want to the UK. I got very fond of Paris and I wanted to stay in Paris. I had an aunt who lived in Paris as well. But and but it was part of the trip. So I came to the UK and went to the Cumberland. And uh, the Cumberland was a four-star hotel, a big hotel factory, a uh, great money maker. Uh, but there, there was a, an incredible manager there called... Uh, um, Mr. Norman Braids, a former RAF officer, 
who had taken over, who was a, a well-known manager. And he was about to open a new restaurant called Le Pedo. Uh, restaurants in, at that time, so I'm talking about now the late uh, mid-60s, restaurants in, in that time were uh, in the big hotels were all grill rooms, pretty much. There was a well-known standalone Monaco restaurant in Piccadilly Circus, but otherwise there were just grill rooms. So this new restaurant that uh, they opened, the company was owned by uh, Jay Lyons, uh, famous for the coffee shop, for the tea shops. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jay Lyons were an incredible company for training. They had Cadby Hall in uh, Hammersmith, where, you, where they just ran uh, courses nonstop. So for somebody like me, that was just manna from heaven because mm. one could learn so much. And this man, Norman Braids, was just uh, exceptional. He instilled discipline in me, which I badly needed, uh, <laughs> very badly needed, and put up with my uh, many mistakes that I made as a commie waiter, mm -hmm. but uh, made me understand that, you know, everybody's allowed to make mistakes as long as you learn from them. Mm. And uh, uh, the army discipline that instilled in all the team was beneficial because you had to look good all the time. You have to behave properly. You have to be on time. Mm -hmm. It took a long time for me to understand being on time. But you know, all, 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 <laughs> all of these work. things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all, all of those things. And then, uh, so the Lepido Open was a great success. And uh, um, eventually I was made uh, uh, an assistant to Mr. Braids. And being made an assistant in those days was quite difficult because as a head waiter, I, had big, I was earning good wages, very good wages. But when you became part of the, uh, of the management team, your wages halved. Hmm? So I thought it was a big decision. And most people didn't take that step because they thought, you know, why should I have half the wages for arguably a bit more work? But Mr. Brace convinced me. Uh, what, why did they halve the wages? Just because uh, uh, they viewed, Jay Lyons viewed that being an assist, uh, a trainee, assistant manager, mm -hmm. you had potential in future ahead of you. Uh -huh. Yes. Of if you uh, stayed, uh, if, you, if you were uh, an head waiter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're at you, the top of. You would uh, remain as a head yeah. waiter. No, you would be very that. good. Your yeah. Ceiling, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I bet. Okay. So, so uh, and. And they were investing in you as well, in sending you in all these courses and so on. So anyway, I, I decided yes. that, that that was the, the part I should take. Uh, and uh, then Mr. Braids retired, so I took over from him. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking over from him was a big learning, learning curve because all of the ad waiters had been in the restaurant for 20, 30, 35 years, 40 years. It wasn't uh, unusual for somebody to receive a, a gold watch after mm -hmm. 50 years service. You know, it was the norm. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. And, um, and indeed, I, I got my, then the, it was 50 years initially, then it became 25 years to get a gold watch yeah. with the company. And luckily I, I, <laughs> I got one as well. But it, it then again, it, it instilled in me and the memories of loyalty, uh, service, what service means, how you keep yourself motivated after mm -hmm. 30 years of doing the same job, uh, big learning curves. And as a young assistant manager and then manager, to have to manage all of a sudden head waiters who do far more than I did, but far more experience than I did, was definitely, if I was begetted, that's definitely um, sort of brought you back down brought to earth. Brought me very much back down to earth mm -hmm. and sort of saying, you know, how do I manage this situation? Mm. But these are life experiences that make you sure. build your character. Um, we then uh, open up, uh, another, opened up another restaurant, an English restaurant at the company called The Wyvern, which was very successful and was everything English. Um, we had an English, an English uh, wine festival when English wines were not even thought of. Uh, so it was really avant-garde, if you like, but going back to Lepido, it was different from the um, from the other grill room restaurants because it had a gimmick for the first time in London. That it had a gimmick, and uh, our gimmick was uh, brochettes. So there were 
food cooked on skewers, and there was this circular grill in the middle of the restaurant. All the staff, the waiters were wearing Cossack uniform, uh, Cossack red, gold <laughs> buttons, and a black sash. Uh, so there was quite a bit of theater. It was the beginning. And um, um, uh, then, you know, new people were beginning to become into the market, the Rue Brothers and so on. Mm-hmm. The, the scene in London was really uh, exploding, if you like. My, um, totally unlike when my father came over to take over my, uh, my own business, when he had to go to the chemist to buy olive oil because it was the only place mm. that sold olive oil in London. Mm. So, so yeah, things. So even, <laughs> even my father, that's what he said. That's where he had to buy olive oil in the chemist in those yeah. days. Extraordinary. They yeah. sold it and in the that, chemist for, for health health. Uh, it was, benefits. yes. yes. Like, yes. like you had, uh, what was it, almond oil? Yes, was, uh, of If you had yeah. bad ears, olive oil. I don't know what olive oil was supposed to be for. It was, uh, but people had earache. You oh, would warm well. up the olive yeah. oil and put it in oh, your okay. ear to yeah. unblock your ears. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so you had to go and sort of bite. I know, ridiculous. Yeah. There you go. Mm. But, but then uh, as, as, as places opened and obviously the, uh, the suppliers become more uh, mm-hmm. uh, refined in, in what they sell, and then, uh, but it was the explosion. Mm. The, the 60s was an amazing time to be in London for a young person because everything was happening. The music scene, mm-hmm. uh, everything was happening. London was the place to be. And certainly going back to Italy, people would always say to me, oh, bring me this record, bring me that record. So interested about what happened. Uh, so it, it, was, it was a magical time. And then from there, um, uh, Jay Lyons had financial difficulties as a company. Uh, it was uh, 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 a financial troubling time for, for the industry in the UK, and they had borrowed in dollars. The pound was devalued, mm-hmm. so they were they were in trouble. And they spent a uh, lot forte, Charles Forte of Trust House Forte bought the company. So from Jay Lyons, then I became a Forte employee, and I met uh, my other great sponsor of my life, Lord Forte. Uh, I was the most incredible person. Um, I think I'm talking too much about my, my no, beginning. Well, my only, beginning well, is fantastic. You're only halfway through. You haven't even started yet. <laughs> and, and really, um, from, from, uh, from being a, a, um, a small company that was projecting to, it was at the time, the largest company of the world, in the world. And, and from the company that I got... Uh, I got uh, given the restaurant manager's job at uh, 90 per cent of the governor house, the newest thing in town. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lord when, was, when was this, sorry? This would have been in... Um, you were before you were born. <laughs> 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 That's uh, a very long time ago. It would have been early, early 70s. Ah. Okay. And Lord Forty had his head offices at, uh, at Bart Lane, at Governor House. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, this was his canteen, really. So he came every day. Wow. Uh, and he brought guests every day, and everybody who was anybody came every day. Um, so it was um, it was a great experience in a different point from a different point of view. Uh, the standards were considerably higher, um, and um, the clientele was uh, different. So it was something I had to get used to, and. Uh, and the team was different as well. So, uh, but it gave me a platform to uh, put some ideas that I'd learned uh, into, into place. And luckily, they were, they were very successful. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, Lord Forte, eventually, uh, many years after, uh, the company was bought by IT, ITV and Granada. And when I met another amazing man, Charles Allen, uh, uh, again, who became a sponsor, uh, um, of myself, and now through the Good Service Scholarship is one of our major sponsors mm-hmm. at the Good Service mm-hmm. Scholarship. Um, but going back to Lord Forte. Um, well, you got him his first star, didn't you, at 95? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, we were very lucky to, to, to be awarded the first Michelin star for the company when I was at Governor House and at 90 Bath Lane, which was a lovely accolade. And, was who, a, and who was the chef then? Uh, uh, Stephen Goodlad. Right. Uh, a young, a wonderful young man. Uh, very talented. We had a very talented team, um, and quite a, quite a lot of uh, the two chefs that were in in this team, but then became famous chefs mm-hmm. and at the restaurants of their own. So many 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 people in service and and kitchen 
uh, form the career at Grosvenor House. Um, why don't you tell us a bit well, about Well, you your... haven't even got to us yet, so what <laughs> happened to b- between Grosvenor House and ending it up The best part? Us? Yeah. Okay. The best part. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, when, when, when we had our first Michelin star, it was um, at the time that Louis Outhier, a famous three Michelin star chef from Loisis, uh, Atlanta Pool, um, was a consultant mm-hmm. to, the, uh, to the hotel. Um, uh, and then he, uh, he had closed, he had then uh, left his restaurant, uh, but, but two or three years later, but before he, he, le- he left his restaurant, Lord Forte asked me to... Um, Go and reopen Loisis, Atlanta Pool. And before that, I went, I went on trips with Louis Outhier. Louis Outhier was, he followed the trail of great chefs like Bocuse and so on, who opened up restaurants around the world. So with Outhier, we went to, um, he took me to uh, Osaka in Japan to, to open, to oversee the restaurant there. And then we went to Bangkok. Uh, Very uh, different the, styles at, of restaurants. At, at the Mandarin Oriental. Thought, yeah. Yes, at that time, and yeah. at the Mand Oriental, oh. the uh, the Normandy restaurant, which still exists now, with with Salin Rue, is uh, taken over now. Uh, and Louis Autier was um, an incredible chef who had uh, introduced Oriental flavors into his cooking, um, and which were totally unknown at the time. Uh, a classically trained chef, uh, trained by Ferdinand Point. Uh, um, and he was, in, to, to, to my mind, he was one of the great chefs of our era, so, definitely. And then uh, when he reopened his restaurant at, uh, at Loisis, because he had, he had retired, but then he was coaxing to reopen it again for, for a Japanese company, he then asked me to go and open the restaurant at Loisis at Lana Pool, um, with Lord Forte, obviously, uh, said that I should go. And it was interesting to open a restaurant in... Um, uh, in France, um, I I'm, I'm not a natural French speaker, even though I studied French and I mm-hmm. fairly speak French f- fairly fluently. But when you are dealing with customer, obviously uh, the articulation is quite different. Mm. Uh, so it was very interesting. It was interesting also to uh, uncover the old restaurant furniture and put it into Loisis. Loisis is a small small villa house, two floor house. And there's a great uh, uh, garden with plain trees. And in summer, and it was only open in summer, we would uh, set up the restaurant, but then everything will be served outside also. And, and we always hoped that there will be no, uh, no bad weather. So everybody will mm-hmm. dine outside. So it was quite interesting in, um, having a, in May when the plain trees are in flower and they just drop all the time. So we do miss some plus in the morning and, an hour later, we had to clean all the tables again <laughs> and again. And then all of a sudden, we might get some wind. And again, uh, we might have some rain. I remember one particular night we were uh, booked to the rafters and uh, the space inside was not as big as the one outside. And it started to rain. So we were booked. It was, the, it was at the Cannes Festival. Uh, we had actors, we had producers, we had directors coming over. Uh, we had uh, Alain Ducasse coming over, who was recovering from his uh, from his accident, yeah. and we had the head of uh, Gordon Mio coming with him, and we had to find space for them to put them inside, and they were about four tables short. So that was exciting. It's not an unusual challenge <laughs> for British say, restaurants, yes, no. I have to say, the rain. No. And that, <laughs> but, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, is hospitality, <laughs> yeah. dealing with that situation yeah. and God. making it seem as if yeah. nothing yeah. has happened. That's it. These, these situations are uh, uh, overcome so easily because of teamwork. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that we sometimes underplay how strong our teamwork is in our establishments and how good our colleagues are and how we react to all sorts of situations. Um, I mean, you know, in my time, we've had the three-day week, which you might have heard of. Um, we've had f- financial disasters where things went really, really bad. Um, recently, we've had the uh, COVID situation, mm. but our industry is so resilient it always recovers. Yeah. And not only that, I think it comes back better and stronger. Mm. Mm. And I certainly believe that the COVID has made us uh, look 
uh, in a different way how to run our businesses. Mm-hmm. I think perhaps we had um, become a bit too uh, complacent in the way sure. we ran things. Perhaps we hadn't taken the eye off the hours that our people worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps the remuneration we gave to mm-hmm. our people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that made us think. But, you know, we, we are good at learning. And we, one of our great strengths, I think, we learn, we learn on our feet, on our feet. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. because we have to react instantly. Mm-hmm. We don't have time to do, to do mm-hmm. charts and do consultations. Customers in front of you, you've got to react yeah. there and then. Yeah. And hopefully you make the right decision. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there are lots of lots of other things that happen certainly in Forte, uh, but uh, but I'm sure we'll come we'll come along. We'll be touch on the subject afterwards. Mm. So, wh- where in the timeline did you meet Natasha? Uh, uh, see, fast forward a bit. Would you like the date and the hour? And the day? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when when Ninety Park Lane uh, was uh, then taken over by. Uh, but Nicola Dennis, the hotel. The, uh, you were to step back a bit because you were very instrumental in that. So don't underplay your your part yeah. in that. Um, I, I, by then I had become I had taken I become food and beverage manager, mm-hmm. and it, it it was it was an, it was looking for a new way of doing things, and I I, I realized that in big companies uh, invested heavily in an outsider. Mm-hmm. Uh, much more so than what the talent they had in the in, in 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 the house, because I don't think it was wrong. I think it was what the the market wanted. So when it came to choosing a a, a, um, a great chef that would work well with Governor House, I think Nicola Dennis was quite quite important uh, and a, an incredible name. I had the good fortune. I had a meal at Great Portland Street when Nico had two Michelin stars. Mm. And it was one of the, more, of the best meals I've ever remember mm. having. So it was, it was incredible. Um, but at the time, it was completely revolutionary for mm. a chef to move into a hotel yeah. because chefs had their own restaurants and yeah. that's the way they operated. And up until then, that's how we operated. My mum and dad, you know, moved. Okay, they moved many times over the mm. years, but yeah. it was their little private business. and. It was a combination of Gerald Lipton. Gerald Lipton was very um, influential in our industry. He owned China Craft. Mm -hmm. So because he supplied China and glassware to all the top restaurants throughout, like all the suppliers, they really know what's happening in the industry and they really know who's busy or not busy or whatever. And he, so you used, China Craft at Grosvenor House. Yes. So it was a combination of Gerald Lipton and, and Gerald Tony Lip- Merkitt. Yeah. And Gerald the, Lipton came to the Oasis at London Pool every summer. Because on holiday, he also yeah. had a property in the south of France, absolutely. So he knew Loasis. He knew you from Loasis. He knew you from Grosvenor House. Tony Merkitt was the then general manager of the Grosvenor House. Um, and somehow the three of you got together and thought, I know, why don't we put a named chef into our empty premises? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's how we became the first, or my father became the first named chef to go into a hotel, which Mm. everybody at the time thought was complete madness. And tell our listeners who your father is. My father is Nicola Dennis, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, And um, now it's routine that people take up slots in other mm. people's business or in the way that for instance um when i was a kid selfridges was a department store which sold all sorts of stuff now selfridges is a collection of boutiques mm-hmm. within under the umbrella of selfridges um yeah. selling so prada have their boutique dior have their boutique louis vuitton have their boutique all in one space well it was sort of a bit like that mm. when we moved into the grosvenor house and my father was very much a trendsetter mm. and led rather than followed in most things. Um, and now it's become normal to do that sort of thing. But at the time, it was it was unusual. Adds yeah. to the prestige of the hotel having it's that It's a named. win-win, isn't it? Yeah, it kind absolutely. Of works, yeah. So this and, is uh, clearly an iconic yeah. restaurant, iconic chef. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a bit about the service side of that in, the, in those times. Um, what was it like? Well, 
the way I I have a, a different my my route into hospitality is very different to Sergio's. Mm. I'm a restaurant brat basically. Mm -hmm. So on my mother's side, the French side of the family, I'm a fourth generation restaurateur. And on my father's side, the Greek side of my family, I'm actually a third generation restaurateur. And um, so they opened their restaurant together, my mother and father, in back in 1973. So the first version of Shane Nico was 1973. So my sister and I uh, grew up within the restaurant world. And uh, my sister is called Isabella and Isabella and I went to the French Lycée. And at the French Lycée at the time, we were at school with all the other restaurant brats in London. So we were at school with Michel Roux's daughters. We were at school with uh, the Lermites from Montplaisir. We were at school for, with the Lugny boys and uh, their father ran Trader Vic's in the mm. Hilton. We were at school with Guy Mouiron's son. So all of the restaurant kids all went to the French Lycée. So we, we, I've got restaurant running through my blood on mm -hmm. both sides of the family. And um, when my parents started off, it was a very, very small business, just the two of them. So it was not unusual to have the kids around because where else do you put them? So we used to very often have... Um, sit in the back table at the restaurant doing our homework in the evening and have something to eat. So daddy's doing the main service and mummy's bringing us something to eat. And then, of course, we'd be exhausted and we'd fall asleep at the table and then we'd get carried home in the evening <laughs> up until we were very young at that point. And then eventually my grandmother came and lived with us. So she was looking after us. So we didn't have to live such a nomadic life. But I still very vividly remember on a Saturday morning going to help my parents clean the restaurant, well, clean the restaurant when you're a kid. So they give you a, a brush and they say, go and brush the banquette. So you know, <laughs> that was my big job, brushing the crumbs off the banquette yeah. on a Saturday morning and that sort of thing. But that was totally the norm for that, you. And that was never exactly. going to be any different, right? Because so, Exactly. So yeah. that's how we grew up. So actually, there is nothing I know more than restaurants, inside yeah. and out. And the thing is that when your father is a chef and your mother is front of house, mm. I know all sides of the business. So yeah, yeah. the kitchen, the chefs, the food side, and the front of house staff. And that side of how you run a restaurant. Mm. And of course, the finances. But when you're a child, you don't know what that means. But you know that your parents are always talking about money or the cost of things or mm. how are we going to mm. do this. And my mother used to walk around with a, a basket where she had, in effect, what was the till? It was a little tin with a key where she'd keep all the all the takings from the thing. And Isabella and I used to think this was like fascinating. <laughs> all this money, all this money. And it was like, it was probably about what well, Daddy always used to say, that I think their first week when they opened in Dulwich, they mm. took the principal sum of five pounds and they thought that they were millionaires. They thought they'd mm. made it. So there probably wasn't very much in the till, but Isabella and I used to think this was terribly <laughs> exciting. And then um, as I grew up, I did things like I used to grow herbs for my father. Now we're going back to remember the days of saumon and l'ose. Yeah, I used to grow l'ose for my dad or sorrel in the garden um, and things like that. And I first started actually working in the restaurant when I was about 16. I used to help mm. my mother on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, so... That was my first foray into actually working in front of house, service in the restaurant. And um, But you'd up to that point, you'd watched your mother a lot as well, right? Well, you know, it, it was, was just very... sort of just part of yeah. it. I don't, we were, because restaurant life is so intense, as we all know, we had to be not far from the actual business. So either mm. five minutes drive, or living on top. When we mm. moved to Battersea, yeah. we actually lived upstairs. So it was not uncommon for us to come downstairs in the middle of the service, not exactly in our pyjamas, but pretty much, and say, Mummy, I need this, or can you help me with this? Mm. And she's like, yes, you just wait there one sec. I've just got to go and take this order, and I'll come back. <laughs> so it was not our, our customers knew. I mean, a lot of our customers knew us from babies all the way up when we were actually running the restaurant. Yeah, there's some beauty in that, though, as it's well. Lovely. The family restaurant, you know, and you that don't get was that very so much, much anymore, part of 
what made our restaurant so different really yeah. to other restaurants. Um, and then by the time I got to about 17 or 18, when I was doing my studies, which I loathed because I am, <laughs> I'm not a naturally studious person. Yeah. Plus I'm dyslexic. So anything visual is interesting to me. Anything that you have to write down or learn is very boring and tedious. Which really, yeah, was the, the, the way they did education for a large number of years, wasn't it? Exactly. They, they were just you know, exactly. inside that. That was how you measured whether you were good enough. Oh, know? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I uh, got to study time and I thought, what's the thing I know absolutely the most about? In my sleep, backwards, forwards, I don't need to study or know anything about is restaurants. Yeah. The last thing I want to do is go into restaurants. I've just seen my parents do it. There is no way I'm going to do what I want to do. And I actually um, loved art and I drew. Ever since yeah. I was a child, I was a drawer, a drawer or a make things or that was my sort of thing. So I studied history of art and design and marketing because the last thing I actually wanted to do was ever run a restaurant. I'm not doing that. That worked well. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, and basically, so I went off, studied that. And um, meanwhile, Isabel was, uh, Isabel is very beautiful and she became a model and she went into modeling, which she still does to this day. Mm -hmm. And um, so there am I going off doing something completely different. And by this time, I think we were probably about um, the, well, I'd worked a bit in when we were in Rochester Row and then we were in Great Portland Street. And by that time we had two stars. Mm -hmm. So we, we didn't get stars by accident. That would be underplaying it all. Daddy got his first star, of which he was extraordinarily proud, obviously being entirely self-taught. Mm -hmm. But because my father was very, he was a perfectionist. And just because he hadn't learnt it or studied it didn't mean he couldn't be the best at it. Mm -hmm. So in his mind, one star was great, but apparently there is such a thing as three stars. So why would I stop at one when I can have three? And his goal became to get his third star. And I'm not sure if we all realised what that meant at the time. No. Mm -hmm. In this little mom and pop restaurant with the kids running yeah. around and three German shepherds by that time as well. Um, were, you, were your parents su surprised by your and Isabella's move out of restaurants? Were, did they say anything about that? Because obviously they had a deep love of hospitality. Yeah. Were they a little bit? Not did they really, ever say? Because they're I, I, you know what? I would call us. I don't know if my mother would agree with this now, but we were kind of accidental restaurateurs. Mm -hmm. Insofar as Daddy had done a million other things before he became a chef, mm -hmm. and that was just his latest project. But he discovered that he was actually extraordinarily talented at it. Yeah, and exceptional at it. Self-taught, yeah, he's, he's got to be, right? You know. Well, for instance, yeah. when he learned to cook, the big explosion that we've had in recent years in cookery books and that sort of thing, mm, that was yeah. non-existent. So if you wanted yeah. to read a cookery book, you would have to read it in French. Mm -hmm. So take one step back. How do I achieve that? I have to learn French. I mean, that was my dad. <laughs> So, obviously, because my mother and her family... You, you've got to admire that kind of... Well, yeah, no, see, yeah. yes. Drive. So, yes, yeah. drive, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, my mother and her family are, are French. So, yeah. you know, he would say to mummy, yeah, help me to understand this and translate the recipes and all of that sort of stuff. So, he learned initially from a book. And, as I said, we ended up with one star. But that wasn't enough for him because one star is not the pinnacle of the... The star system and this yeah. mythical thing called Michelin, which he mm. was learning about. So we need three stars. And we decided as a family, really, that the only way, not the only way, one of the best ways for us to achieve that 
was to make it a family project. Because if you all work together and you all pull together in the same direction, no one is going to work longer, harder or better for you than your own family mm -hmm. together. Because the achievement is theirs as well. Yeah, ultimately. So we all came back together. Yeah. And plowed on until eventually we got our three stars. Amazing. <laughs> oh, you say it like it was so easy. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet it wasn't. That sounds well, amazing. I mean, we had extraordinary people yeah. working for us along the yeah. way. Mm -hmm. All of my father's boys have gone on to be exceptional, mm -hmm. to run their own businesses, to be uh, household names, to write books, to to achieve in their own right. Mm -hmm. um, all of our front of house were fantastic. I mean, yeah. just amazing. All of our customers who followed us assiduously from restaurant to restaurant, mm -hmm. um, who brought their kids eventually mm. to the restaurant and their kids who grew up with us throughout the restaurant. Um, and at my father's funeral back in October, the place was absolutely rampacked with all of his boys, all of mummy's front of house staff, our customers, our friends. I mean, it was just the most extraordinary yeah. Chez Nico reunion. And we just had the best day. It was just weird because he wasn't there. Yeah, but otherwise, it, it was, a, a, you know, a big Le Dennis family party, quite honestly. Yeah. And testament to the legacy that he left, you know, the, 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 the fact that he drove, all these people have clearly been inspired mm. to, to, to drive themselves oh, as far as he did, the, right? The, the and things that the boys said incredible. were just amazing. It yeah. was, it was, um, it was quite extraordinary. It really was. Yeah. But part of the service at Chez Nico, I mean, Sergio's view of service was very different because of the establishments so he worked Sergio in. So Sergio was the manager, the restaurant manager, is that right? Uh, no, FME manager, sorry. He oh, was gosh. within the hotels. Mm. And the way that we did service and what made the service special at Chez Nico was, I think, the family mm -hmm. aspect. And that was very, and even Tom Jane, when he was um, editor of the Good Food Guide at the time, he said that the family atmosphere that you find at Chez Nico is totally unique within this type of restaurant. So there was the, not the formality, that's not the right word, but the, the pure classic professionalism, gastronomy mm. and the professionalism of the service and everything, all mixed in with, you know, a, mm. a, a more relaxed family atmosphere, which mm -hmm. didn't detract from the special event that going to Chez Nico was, but it was just kind of slightly more laid back. And your, your service background was a little bit different. Yours is much more technical, I would say. Mine is service divides neatly, I think, into, or we think, into two parts there's the personal part mm -hmm. and what you bring as a person to the service creative element mm. so that. you bring i mean to me you bring kindness mm. you bring empathy you bring emotional intelligence mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. bring politeness if you have kindness politeness and emotional intelligence then you're perfect for this to, to yeah. run a service yeah but there's also the technical side, and that's more your Yes, because field. Without, without the technical abilities, uh, the, the, uh, the emotional part is pretty much we are born with it or not, or we yeah. can learn it, some, not quite, but we can perfect it. The technical, technical ability is something that you need to work hard at it. Yeah. You need to have a passion for it, and uh, it completes you as a package, because when you are sure of your product, you are conversant, well conversant with your product, then it's much easier than to just do the other bit, which is mm -hmm. the personal aspect. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be to be a good salesman, you need to know your product, otherwise it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, and you can only bluff your way out of so many situations, so many times, <laughs> not all of the times. <laughs> 
Uh, so, yeah. and, and, but also it is it is important because when you when you do know your product, then you have pride in your product, mm. uh, then you believe in your product. So these are also things that cement you as a service person, and and good service yeah. mm. and delivers that cons- consistency of your product mm. as Absolutely. well, which is the em- emotional, Absolutely. you know, so it's been intelligence side. Yeah, to their story. Yeah. I mean, we, we touched on a little bit, but we just want to move on to the importance of service mm. uh, for you guys. Mm. Um, if you can uh, share your thoughts on, on mm. that, yeah. Please. Well, it's obviously it's fantastically important because I still remember when we were children. One of the things that my parents liked doing in the summer was driving around France um, and eating in all the three Michelin star mm-hmm. restaurants. So as kids, we did a lot of that. And I can't tell you what we ate. I, I vaguely remember where we went, but I can't be specific about who made the best whatever. But I distinctly remember, even as a child, I distinctly remember at, there's a restaurant in South France called Lusteau de Beaumanier. They had an enormous silver ice cream cart and they would come to the table. And so it was just ice creams and sorbets, but it was so beautifully presented. And the whole show and the spectacle of them doing the serving the ice cream and you choose mm. your flavor and they make all the, the flamboyant delivery of it all. I still remember that to this day. I can't tell you what flavor I ate, but I remember them doing it for us. And then conversely, there was another three-star restaurant in the South of France that I won't name, where um, they, they just saw a young English couple with two little children and they thought, oh, tourist anglais, and shoved us in a corner. Mm. And we had the same food as everybody else had, obviously. But that, and I kind of just remember the vague, obviously we didn't realise as kids what that meant, but we just thought, oh, why, are we, why are we not sitting in the pretty bit over there? Mm. So those were two aspects of service that stuck in my mind to this day. So everyone always says service is the way that you are made to feel. Yeah. It's not a tangible thing, mm-hmm. but it's the bits that people remember possibly long after they've actually digested the food. And that's what makes people want to go Mm. back somewhere. And delivering that level of service to every table is also something beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, I I think one one can overthink service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, And it's uh, easily done because it has so many aspects Mm -hmm. that you want to be good at. We always used to... um, Think of its service as you're in, you're on stage when you are in your room, mm-hmm. and every that that happens before the door opens and customers come in, your mise en place is very important. Uh, the moment before customers come in, when you have the last minute uh, touch up, where your uniform is clean, your hair is is in a good place. Uh, your mm-hmm. shoes are, are polished uh, and you are ready to perform because the play starts then when they, door, they open the door. I think this is very important and, and very um, exhilarating. When you have your briefing with the chef, everybody's conversant with what happens. And then when you door open, then that's it. You know, curtains are drawn, lights go down, you're on stage, the, the play is happening. Um, and and then that's when the team effort comes in, that everybody has a part to play. And uh, um, service is not about a one-man show. No. Sometimes mm. it is because it's only one person, but mm. normally it's teamwork. Was there anything that you particularly liked to do when you did your briefings to get everybody into that? Oh, just to get a briefing was an absolute miracle. I'm telling you, it is (laughs) such an important part of the service. But going back then, people regard didn't see the importance of it Mm. at all. They didn't understand the importance Mm. of it. It is absolutely critical. You can't walk into a situation blind. You have to be prepared. And prepared doesn't mean your tables are all laid. That's a given. Of course, your tables are all laid. Yeah. You have to know who's going to walk through the door. You have to know why they're there. 
You're going to have to know how many are there. You're going to have to know how long they're going to be there for. I mean, it just, it is crucial mm. to get everyone together for five minutes at the beginning of service, get everyone on the same page, get, it's, it's the equivalent of a, a huddle in, in the sporting mm. world before an event. It is crucial. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love the most is when you walk past a restaurant just before lunchtime or when we're at the Ritz working, very often we are, um, and uh, we're having a, a meeting or something or conversation with someone just outside and I can see them doing their briefing. And I just, I absolutely <laughs> love that. And, for, and the other day we were with someone and I just got up and I went to listen to the briefing at the door. Because to me, that is so important. And now it's very, very common and everybody yeah. does it. Yes. Yeah. And very often on Instagram, people post, oh, look, pre-service briefing. And I'm always the first to go, absolutely, we need a briefing. <laughs> Keep up the briefing. Yeah, because because uh, we were always thought that you have to think on your feet, as we said before. Mm. Then obviously, and and we are masters at overcoming bad situations. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes there was a feeling that you didn't need, you didn't need a briefing because you could cope with anything that mm -hmm. happened. But of course, that was very, very old thinking. Yes, it, it, it is very important mm. uh, because uh, that is the plan. That is the focus that you have yeah. for the rest mm. of the service. Mm. And without that, things can go it's wrong. It's like your game plan or tactics. In a totally. Yeah. Yeah. totally. Yeah. Tactics. Things That's can go exactly wrong. what it is. Mm. And and they can go can go very badly wrong sometimes if yes. you don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. And to to have the team, the kitchen, and and the service to be on the same understanding, sure. then obviously things are much easier. Mm. Yeah, it gets everything aligned. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and it and it gets you in the zone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just about to say, yeah, yes. when because when I worked in reception office, I used to print out the briefing sheets. It's one of the things. So I always knew whatever David was going to say because yes. I knew who was coming in. Yes. Um, but I think the thing for me was that it was, um, you know, kind of passing through that veil of right now we're in. Yeah. We're now we're in professional yeah. mode. Yeah. We're, they're about to come in. We're on yeah. Blast. yeah. Yes. And yes. Uh, it was an opportunity as well for, for those who are more experienced, uh, the managers, um, to, you know, give over their experience to those who may be doing mm. their first service, who mm. may not be, you know, uh, knowing what to expect and to kind of, you know, bring it calm, bring yeah. that level to yeah. that professional yeah. feeling, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Give, give them the information that they need that yeah. will help yeah. them to give, deliver what you yeah. want to. Yeah, I yeah. do, yeah. Don't leave anything to chance. Yeah. Make sure that everything is covered. Yeah. Yeah. And encourage mm -hmm. people to ask questions. At, at, yes. uh, it is not yeah. just a lessening it's yeah. situation. It's nice when you give them a, a sort of vision of what to expect. And then when it does happen, the, the, how did you know that? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, makes it makes it so professional. It makes it, it seem yeah. effortless, doesn't it? Oh, you know. Certain. I, I think, just remembered. Yeah. As, yeah. as, restaurant, as restaurant people, yeah. sometimes we, we lack and. Uh, and well, when I became a, a food and beverage and back within the mm. act at Governor House, it was good to have people to, restaurant people, to deal with events. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. when you have an event, everything has to be planned beforehand. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. you know, there are no stations for cutlery. Mm -hmm. There's no extra glasses standing there waiting for you. You've got to plan everything. And so it becomes into the mindset yeah. of being ready. And that's very important. As restaurant people, sometimes that was a miss. But as, as Natasha said, you know, things have got much better now. And, and that yeah. key information point is there and it happens all the time, which is great. Hmm. And of course, you, get, you, you, you also get the other recognition yeah. that the customer wants because ultimately service is about uh, recognizing and valuing yeah. why people come into your restaurant. Hmm. Well, people have traveled, people who have but that kind of leads us on to the next uh, yes. topic yeah. I want to talk about, which is uh, customer relations and regulars. Mm. How would you encourage those people back uh, to you? First and foremost, I think that uh, every, anybody who comes through your door is a special person who has maybe traveled a long way, uh, willing to part with a lot of money in some cases, certainly these days, mm -hmm. uh, might have... Uh, celebration, but I've had a difficult meeting, 
might have had so many, so many issues. Uh, and you have to uh, uh, welcome them in the same way. Never judge a customer when they walk through the door. Never. Uh, uh, by their dress yeah. or by their... Of the English family in the yeah, corner. Never uh, yeah, make or, that mistake. If someone can afford, if someone makes a reservation at Shaniqua or Medla or whatever, they know what they're doing. They know that they are going to where and why and how they're going to spend their money. So if they turn up in jeans and trainers or if they turn up, you know, in sparkles mm -hmm. and sequins, never assume. Always treat everyone the same. Yes, I mean, the, uh, and... Normal customer uh, pe people who come to you the first time they they're not sure about what to expect, so you have to be there to uh, be of a, a comforting mm -hmm. to them when they see you. They can rely upon you. They can relate to you right away. Uh, your smile and your demeanor will make them feel at ease and make them feel that anything they want you're there to provide it in a, in a nice manner. Not in a sultry and know it all manner, but in just in a pleasant manner. You're mm. there to make sure that they enjoy their experience. Uh, and as I said, people have come from different backgrounds, from different situations. So you have to be able to judge what that might be. Yeah. People who, who are fortunate, if we are fortunate enough to have customers that come back to us time and time again, I always used to tell our team that we have made a contract with this person, with these people. This contract is not written. Mm -hmm. It is not signed by anybody. However, it's a contract. And the contract is that they come to us because they expect something from us, which is, might be the food, might be whatever it is. We, in turn, know what their expectations are and we have to deliver it. So we must never lose track of that. And also not to get, and it's easy to, to happen, to get over familiar. Mm -hmm. Always understand that there is a separation between a customer yeah. and we, the provider. I always say to our kids, they might think that they're your best friend, mm -hmm. but don't make the mistake that you are their best friend. There is there is a division. And they like being informal with you and they yeah. might they like feeling part of your family and yeah. part of it. But don't push that line. No where the line is. That's also part of yeah. good service. Mm. Yeah. Emotional intelligence is so important, impossible to teach, difficult to explain even, mm. but being able to read people like yeah. we've discussed before. It, it, it's very before. difficult to explain, isn't it? Some of our regulars, yeah, they, 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 they use words like, the, I'm coming for my meddler fix. So what does that mean? <laughs> 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 So Sounds it's like you're a drunk. It's obviously the feeling, isn't it, of being <laughs> yeah. there. Yes. Uh, it's, yeah. like you say, it's not just the food, it's the whole feeling of, you know, warmth. Mm. And, and they yeah. know what they want. And the, 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 you talked about the family aspect. Mm. You know, I remember customers coming into Medler and saying to me, oh, are you related in some way to <laughs> David? <laughs> I, it was, honestly, it happened every yes. week. Mm. And I think because yes. people just actually really wanted to believe that mm. we had that mm. family aspect, mm. uh, you know. So it's the warmth that's provided, isn't it, from the service? Mm. But quite right, I think that's. I think you know, I think when they're all aligned with the food as well, it, it makes it very special. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah absolutely. It is a complete. And, and I would include the wine yeah. program in that as yeah. well. Yeah, totally, absolutely. Totally. absolutely. Yeah. The the empowerment that you give to the people who work for you mm -hmm. um, makes them feel that this is a family. Yeah, and and and. People need to be focused and feel empowered and feel that they actually matter mm -hmm. to you mm. yeah. as, as a member of, of, of your team because then it's easier to take ownership of what you give and be very credible. Yeah. Sometimes, and we, we've all experienced that, you know, we have a situation whereby we get recited a spiel. It's not really credible. Mm. And that's... Yes. that that's It's a, contrived. Yes, it? yeah. yes. That, that's sad, but... Mm. Well, it's fun, funny what you you're saying about um, you, you know your your team as well, but that leads us on to our next question, doesn't mm. it? How you would build and motivate your teams? If you could, uh, Again, from our yeah. side, and my, it, very different to yeah. Sergio's side. The family aspect of our business 
yeah. was so much part of everything. Integral. So part of obviously us as a family mm-hmm. and that family made that business the way it was. Yeah. The customers then joined in that family and we all grew up together. Um, and Do you think that also solidified your teams together? They well, also felt and the staff like a family also, member. I mean, we had... Members of staff, I mean, Jean-Luc worked for us. How long did Jean-Luc work for us? God, years. Yes. Sorry, Jean-Luc, I can't quite remember. But <laughs> he was our, our maitre d' for, I don't know, I want to say 10, 15 years oh, at least. Yes. Um, our chefs in the kitchen stayed for many years. I mean, joining Chez Nico, you really became part of the Le Dennis family because yeah. everything was so integrated i mean i reception was my big thing as we've had these conversations before about reception um i remember at one point i had a tiny little flat off the edgeware road this was when we were in park lane and um i had two receptionists living with me two of the girls because okay i'm a london kid and i grew up in this wonderful melting pot that we call london but a lot of kids travel from around the country into London to find work. And these two girls were, one was from Kings Lynn, and so that was Emma. Zoe, I can't remember where she was from, but they hadn't found anywhere to live yet. And we all know how difficult it is finding somewhere affordable. In yeah. London. So I had two receptionists living with me in a tiny flat. So I was in my bedroom, Emma was on the sofa, and I only left one place for Zoe to sleep, and that was the bathtub. <laughs> so every night after service, we'd line the bathtub with a duvet and chuck some pillows in, and that was her bed yeah. until she found somewhere to stay. So that's how we looked after our teams and and helped them and hopefully encouraged them to stay with us. We mm. gave them warmth and love, possibly above and beyond, maybe. But I mean, my parents, when the restaurant was in Rochester Road, my parents rented a flat, literally five minutes walk, a staff flat, so that all the boys had somewhere to close by to live. And again, Mm. a lot of them, some were from Ireland, some were from London. Um, Some of the, uh, there was a a French chef at one point who was living there. So we had somewhere local that um, they could live in. And that was, at the time, that was also fairly unusual that my parents should actually Sounds like you poured a lot of care and, and love in, into your teams. It as was well. kind of it was not intentional so much as just mm. kind of normal and, and par for the course. Mm. And maybe it was a very continental attitude, possibly also. Um so that's how yeah. we sort of looked after it's and nurtured fam- our teams. Familiar mm. familiar acts aspect, wasn't it, to mm. it? Yes. You know? So that was like you our said way. when you're growing up, you know, you're inviting in, you know, everybody and it's part of the hospitality mm. is yeah. to mm. open armed kind of attitude of everybody's yes. welcome. Exactly. So that, that's the way be. we'd but yours was very different. Yours was a lot more corporate and how you run but teams yes, within because, a corporate because we were we were in a in a in a big hotel. Organization, yeah. Uh normally with, with loads of people. I I remember that uh, it's all about the memories that you experience. But we had this um, general manager that came to the Cumberland, and I was at the Cumberland, and he was Guy McPherson. He just came. He was at Sandy Lane in mm-hmm. Barbados, yeah. and then he got given the job at the Cumberland general manager, and he was um, um, different from other managers we had before. And but one thing that got this team building was so simple and I thought my god why don't I think of that myself he um, he got all the uh, uh, heads of departments together and introduced himself and got to, got us to introduce ourselves and then he said look I have a very simple message for you this hotel is not where I want it to be it's not where the company wants it to be so we have to start first within the team to be where we want to be and I am telling you now that the word no is not going to exist at the Cumberland whilst I am here. So if you sell your aesthetic services that you want those lights fixed, the answer from technical services is yes, I will. It'll be fixed in 10 minutes or whatever it is. If a customer says to you, Sergio, 
uh, I want smoked salmon, I don't want any of your fancy food. And the chef will say, of course, no problem. So we came, we came away from that meeting, and it wasn't a long meeting, it was a short mm-hmm. meeting, and we just felt, wow, you know, I can now rely upon all my colleagues because I know that no one will let me down because we dare not say no to anything. And, and I thought, isn't that simple? But that's what yeah. it's all about, really, isn't it? Uh, uh, just being able to do that. And that, is, that makes the team very strong and very empowered. I think mm-hmm. empowerment, you know, it, it's very important yeah. that you feel that you matter, that you count, that you can make decisions. Yes. Decision can be at different levels, can be small, medium, large, but you can make them. And that is very important. Um, certainly, as a leader of a team, you've got to be seen to be standing up for your team. You've got to fight the battles for your team. You, you, you must make the f- team feel that they got your back all the time. Um, and... Um, when, when, when I was at the Cumberland, people's wages, and they weren't bad wages, they were good wages, but they were made up of tips. Um, and you got a very basic salary, a minimal salary, and then everything was made up of tips. Mm-hmm. And you could not solicit for tips. Tips were given voluntarily mm-hmm. by your good service, and tips came in various sizes, small, large, nothing, but they were just made up of tips. So you work very hard, and at the end of the week, you had your meager guaranteed basic, and hopefully some tips that would make up. Um, so thanks to Lord Forte, when I went to the governor house, I was able to go to him and say, look, you know, can I, but you please allow me to introduce service charge in the restaurant didn't exist in London, didn't exist in hotels. Um, and he said, come back to me. But I need a bit more information. What does it mean? Mm-hmm. What are the implications? Uh, what does it mean to the average bills? Uh, because I just didn't want, to, I didn't want to have it for the restaurant. I wanted to have it that the kitchen staff would partake, the, the back of, and all back of ours would partake, and every service person. So eventually, the... Uh, uh, came back, said, okay, fine, let's have a six-month trial, see how it goes. So that that happened, and it was easily accepted. Uh, customer did not really mind, um, by and large, and uh, it was discretionary, of course, and, and then it was adopted by everybody, and this still is the system we have now. Yes. Um, which, if we have time, I'd like to come back to it and say that it's about time that we updated. But, however, that was uh, um, an instance of where people felt that the, the boss, the manager, was actually looking out for them. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's very important that you mm. feel that. Uh, uh, as, as it is very important that in a restaurant situation, the chef and the, and the manager are thinking on level terms that their relationship is wonderful, uh, that it is seen to be wonderful, certainly, mm-hmm. because otherwise, if there is uh, a difference in mm-hmm. character, in ideas, in, 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 in delivery, staff are very quickly to find out the cracks, mm-hmm. and then it can work against you as an operator. Uh, so these are things of making teams. Certainly, we used to, we used to challenge teams, our team, uh, um, every, every week we would say, on a Saturday, normally before, Saturday night was our biggest night, we were closed for lunch, we would meet early in the afternoon, and we would sit down and decide, what are we going to do next week? And it was an open forum, uh, not always coming from, because, from the manager, because if they, if they gave you some ideas, they were committed to it. Mm-hmm. If you told them some ideas, then they say, yes, sir, but you know, maybe mm-hmm. the commitment wasn't yeah. there. So we would think about which cocktails are we going to sell the, this week? Which one are we going to sell? Uh, how, how many are we going to sell? How much are we going to sell? And that worked very, very well. And uh, because people were committed and they felt part of it, they felt they... Uh, and another way of, of uh, that we used to do was to 
I, I loved join, becoming an assistant manager, even though my salary was decreased, mm-hmm. because I had financial responsibilities for the restaurant. And that I enjoyed. I like numbers, I like mm-hmm. figures. And I always wanted to <laughs> I always wanted to impart this skill to my team. Mm-hmm. I didn't want them to be um, worried by it or concerned by it, but I wanted to be aware of it. And I wanted to be aware that if if a customer says, what do you recommend? It is not caviar because it's the most expensive that you recommend because it might not be the most profitable menu. So it was highlighting the, the items on the menu that were most, brought most profit and could be mm. good sellers. Um, so that brought competition within the team, but worked as a team. And, and, and whenever we decided what strategy we had for that week, we, there will be a, a team of three or four different teams of three or four people. And at the end of the week, we would look at the results, how they're done. So Bit of friendly competition. <laughs> never competition, any team but, did it. But it, as yes. a group, not as yes. an individual. Yes, because of course. Then, and then we would change the groups every week. Yeah. So that, because some people lagged behind, some people were very good. Mm-hmm. So that, that brought stability and success. Mm. It's easy to to motivate someone if you give them the reasons behind why you're yes, asking yeah. them to do something rather than just blindly going, do it, don't you think? And, and Yeah, certainly I can imagine the financials bringing the people into understanding the reasons behind, you know, some dishes being sold mm. more than others. Which absolutely, it's yes. brilliant, yeah. yeah. So, um, Sergio, Natasha, um, mm. on, on my... On my- teams over the years mm. um, the sommelier is often like the star striker if it's mm. a football team um, <laughs> what are your you must have seen evolution of sommeliers over the years what are your thoughts on sommeliers wine has changed so much since mm. since mm. we are I'm sure since you started and certainly since I started wine has become a lot more democratised now because mm. Previously, the sommelier was the keeper of all knowledge. Mm-hmm. The wine list was the Bible of everything that you were going to drink. Mm-hmm. You didn't necessarily have any clue what was in it or how or why or what or where or when. You relied on this person to explain it to you mm-hmm. and you were in their um, hands and you put yourself into their hands. Now, um, there's a lot more information about there, a lot more knowledge. Wine drinking is huge in this country. Mm -hmm. People are used to buying um, as part of their supermarket shop. And even if you're not an Aldi shopper, a lot of people know that in the Sunday papers Mm. at weekends, a lot of the top wines that are recommended, you can find in Aldi, for instance. Another thing is the enormous growth in the British wine industry. I mean, Sergio was a champion of it Mm. 50 years ago before anybody had ever heard of it. Now everybody knows English wines. Fantastic when we vineyards. Moved, we, yeah, when we moved really to lucky. East Sussex um, about 10 years ago, um, we were very amused to discover that literally across the road from us, there was a little family vineyard. And we thought, oh, how quaint. Oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> the English people have decided to grow wine. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> but we now, 10 years later, have found ourselves by accident mm. in the middle of the British wine industry. I mean, the wine country. It, it, we are literally, we are 10 minutes from Gusbourne. We are not far from Nightimber. Yeah. And the little happy, clappy family vineyard across the road is a family, it's called Charles Palmer, and they, they produce some extraordinary stuff. Yeah. We have um, another one just across the road from, from us called Tillingham. I mean, I think between East Sussex and Kent, I think there are over 100 vineyards now around us. Yeah, it's quite astounding, isn't it, how many we have. And this is part of, it's now becoming slowly, slowly Mm. part of the culture, Mm -hmm. particularly in the southeast where there are so many, but I know that there are even vineyards in in Yorkshire, I know. Are there Mm. vineyards in Scotland or am I going mad? Not yet. Not yet. We have very (laughs) favourable... Favorable climate as yes. well, don't we, for growing grapes, particularly well, around those and sorts of we have the soil. Sussex. The soil. Yeah. We, have the, we soil. have the same seam yeah. as from Champagne starts in Champagne and carries on across mm. the southeast, mm. which is why who's just bought up half of Kent? Is it Tatanji or Tatanji? Well, they bought, they bought three, Size, three or four years ago. Yeah, parts of it because they're yeah. they're expanding. Yeah. Um, 
across, obviously champagne is only a finite size, but they can mm. produce sparklings um, in, in, um, in England now. And um, it's not uncommon to do things like for birthdays, for um, hen do's, stag do's, for people to go to on wine excursions to wine vineyards. And yeah. you do tastings, mm. you visit the, the, you walk around the vineyards, you have a meal. Um, yeah, the last hen do I went on, I went for a wine <laughs> well, tasting. It was terribly there civilized. You go. There you go. And last summer, my niece organized a hen do for yeah. one of her girlfriends. And they're, they're um, sort of 23, 24, 25, mm. so fairly young. Um, but they went to Tillingham and they had the, the it wine. It shows the enthusiasm there. is there, though, for it. And people are interested and so, don't feel like it's too exclusive exactly. anymore, I think. So it has you changed. Know. Wine mm. has changed so much. Mm. The, the, uh, the role of the sommelier is, uh, imp- yeah, I, can't, I can't understate it, I mean, uh, how important it is. I had a most wonderful experience recently, which really brought home to me to say, wow, this is what being a sommelier means. And uh, we, were, we, were, we were invited uh, and, and a menu was prepared for us and some wines were, were recommended with the menu. And, uh, and the way that the sommelier uh, explained succinctly, not a Bible reading of uh, the provenance and, and the attributes of the wine, but most importantly, uh, his knowledge of the menu. And for every dish, he will say, because you have in Rouget, and because Rouget has got olive, that he would recommend something which would accompany this mm. this particular event. Mm. And I thought, wow, this is the way it should be done. Because gone are the days when you order wine, you want to know everything about the wine, uh, the vine and the wine. I think that's a bit pedantic in my view and boring. Uh, But obviously you need to give some information. But to pick up the item on the menu and your wine, after all, if you're having a flight, that's what it is, a marriage of the two, is very important. Mm. So there is another skill which... In my time, some majors didn't have because mm-hmm. they had no idea what was on the menu. They knew what was on, on, on the wine list, okay. but not necessarily, not necessarily what was on the menu in detail. So I think this is where we are now. And sommeliers are a very well-respected, important part of our, of our sector, no doubt about it, in the same way that mixologists are. Mm-hmm. Uh, incredible people. Uh, uh, that present amazing drinks and have found a way of, of making a cocktail that we all know about uh, looking exceptional mm. by the mere skill. Yes. And maybe given some different uh, uh, explanation of aeration of ice or mixing techniques or why you would use a frozen glass or not. Uh, so, yes, that's where we are in a very happy place, I think. Mm. Yeah, I always find that quite astounding, you know, when somebody places a beautiful cocktail and I've watched them do it as well. There's that theatre, you know, you're talking Uh, about the ice cream car and it's wonderful to watch, isn't it? Well, the Gold Service Scholarship when we had that masterclass. Yes, absolutely. Unbelievable. Well, (laughs) and and some of the prizes for Mm. the winning finalists at the Gold Service Scholarship are not just food orientated. So Mm. they get to travel to vineyards around Europe. So we take them regularly on trips to, mm. um, what was the last one we went Porto, to? Porto, oh, Moselle, mm. yeah. yes, Tokai. Because when you're in service, when you're in front of house, you need to know, and again, we've talked about this before, when you're front of house, you need to understand the entire business from the kitchen and purchasing and producing how and why and when dishes are mm. made and produced to everything that happens in front of house and all the financial implications of running a business, all of this are part of the front of house skills, which yeah. again are totally underestimated by people. Mm-hmm. So it's not uncommon for a restaurant manager to be able to produce an absolutely outstanding dinner because that's just 
what they do. They know how to cook. They understand food. And they're very passionate about every about aspect all of, it. of restaurants. More difficult the other way around. But restaurant managers, front mm. of house people are so multi-skilled. There is so much involved in our jobs. Mm. Well, you do see some chefs bringing food to the table these days. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, they, and they can explain it better, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is, again, product knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons of the trips is that when you experience how it's made, where it's made, yeah. what goes into it, the passion mm. that the people who make it is, then you automatically become an ambassador. And it's very easy to then sell the product onto a customer or explain mm. the, custo- mm. the product yeah. to the customer yes. because you, you've lived it mm-hmm. for a short while. Mm. So you, you become part of it. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's good that you touch on the Go Service Scholarship because uh, um, with the Royal Academy of Culinary Arts yeah. uh, being running an annual awards of excellence, which is an entry level for a uh, young professional in our sector. Uh, and they get tested uh, on, on fairly basic, but laid down traditional skills. And, and they get to meet other people. Uh, they establish a network, mm-hmm. uh, which is very important because their careers will mingle and entwine in the future. Mm-hmm. They get yeah. to know all the judges and we are fortunate that the judges are the top people in our in our in our industry again. Seen here, seen here. One <laughs> um, aspirational. <laughs> um, I did my first year was very good. Yeah. Yes, very good, excellent. Uh, and then uh, there is a natural progression of the journey that you would take the take part in the Go Service Scholarship, where it's a little bit more uh, complicated, maybe not so technical, but certainly emphasizes more on the social skills on your presentation. Uh, uh, and then after you've had 10 years in management, you can then take part of the Master of Culinary Arts. Mm-hmm. But it all begins, and going back to my memories, it all begins with uh, the Adopter School. I don't know whether you're familiar with Adopter School, but Adopter School is uh, uh, something that the Royal Academy of uh, Culinary Arts runs, and it is... Uh, uh, targeted the children at primary school. So where a school, uh, all, all academicians will uh, adopt the school and they will carry out lessons in these schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, lesson is the wrong word. I think a demonstration, uh, an highlight of what service is and what kitchen is. So the chef will go into the school with a tray of different items in color and taste. They will give the children uh, chef set with their name on top <laughs> and they will explain what the flavors are and ask them to try it. And children love this. Mm. And they go home with their hats, tell their parents uh, they experience the VAD. In the service side, side, we because we can't really demonstrate uh, what we do is not really tangible. So what we do is we uh, touch on the etiquette of service. Mm-hmm. So we will have a couple of tables set up on stage mm-hmm. at the school and we'll invite uh, a boy and a girl to come over. We will say that when you go to your table, you pull the chair out for the girl, the girl sits, then you sit yourself. When the menu is given, it's given to the girl first, then to yourself. Then you make a decision how it happens, how you communicate what you offer you like, and then you order. And it is amazing how interested children are in this. Mm -hmm. Um, I want, and government doesn't really invest enough in our industry. Mm -hmm. I I don't want to get political. Let's not go into that. (laughs) But, (laughs) but, uh, you know, it is, it is a fact. It is a fact that, and people have to be in choose and we have to create these memories from an early age because these memories stay with us Mm -hmm. and eventually in your life, you, they, they, they come real again. And in my, uh, if, you, if you look at me, and I told you about John Charles, and I never got to Leeds yeah. <laughs> to see him. But when I was um, at the House and I was then director of food and beverage and banqueting, we had a function one evening. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't there that evening. But the following morning, when I went over for breakfast, for the breakfast service, that's to chat with the HODs to see how it was going. Somebody said, uh, uh, 
Salvatore, oh, yeah. said to me, uh, Mr. Rebecca, you'll be interested to know that John Charles is coming in for breakfast this morning. Wow. So, <laughs> you can well imagine how I felt. <laughs> and you can also well imagine... Years old all of a sudden yeah. again, yeah. yeah. Can imagine how, um, um, how the circle had sort of come round, you know, mm -hmm. but that mm. my memory... Had, and it was this profession that, that provided me with this full circle of meeting John Charles. And one thing that perhaps we're not very good at, <laughs> at putting out there is that all my training in the industry, I got paid for it. Mm -hmm. I was being taught things. I've been taught a profession. I was uh, advancing in my career and I was getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. Now, many other professions mm -hmm. that have perhaps more highlight with families, people want to be doctor, dentist, whatever they have to be, they normally have to pay until mm -hmm. they're 26, 27, 28. At the end of it, they're left with a big uh, sum Debt, of money they have absolutely. to pay back at some stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In our industry, it's all given to us. Mm -hmm. yes. And pretty much you can come off the street into our yes. industry. Going back to John Charles, I went to say hello. He was there with his daughter. We had the photograph taken together. Nice. And I mean, oh. you know, this is what our industry, what hospitality provides for us. Yeah. One of the many, many things that it provides. Many great memories. Mm. <laughs> yes. I mean, we yeah. don't, I, we spend our lives now trying to communicate what an extraordinary career hospitality mm. is, can be for people. Well, yeah, I mean, that, um, we should move on to the point of what your role is in the industry today. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what Sandra and I have now worked together for over 30 years. And everybody knows that basically we're the twofer of hospitality. So you get one, the other one comes free. Yeah? <laughs> you get two for the price of one. And um, as Sandra mentioned, he runs the, um, the annual awards of excellence for the Royal Academy of Culinary Arts the Gold Service Scholarship and the Master of Culinary Arts. So I help Sergio to do that. I assist him in doing that as much as possible to make those the three top front of house competitions in the country. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that we feel that the competitions are so important, apart from, as Sergio said, the networking, the, the learning, the skills and all of that, mm. because you have to practice a lot of skills to enter the competitions that maybe you don't get to do in your everyday life. But also, I think when you start at the age of 22 and you enter the Annual Awards of Excellence, maybe for the first time in your life, maybe you started in catering. There are many reasons why you might start in catering. But very often, people sort of end up in catering because... And I think that when you enter your first competition is maybe the first time in your career that you realize, first of all, it is a career and not just a job. And yep. it is a profession because you know what? I can be tested and judged and I can learn. And oh my gosh, I thought I knew, but in fact, there is so much more to learn. Mm -hmm. And all of these people are in front of me and expect stuff from me that I don't know if I know yet. And I think that's one of the first penny drop moments that people realize that they have landed in a skilled profession rather than just a job. Mm -hmm. And that's one mm -hmm. of the reasons why the competitions are so expensive. Uh, so expensive. <laughs> they're not expensive, they're free. Um, are <laughs> so expensive expensive in time. Yeah. Yes. 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 To organize important. and to deliver. Yeah, yeah very but important. Why they're so yeah. important to people's careers. Absolutely. So that's very much what we do. Um, focus on doing that. But basically, short version is we encourage, we mentor and support young people into hospitality. Mm. Mm. And that obviously has a very long version as well. The long version is the competitions that mm -hmm. we run. Um, we never uh, tell anyone how to run their business specifically, unless asked, and mm -hmm. a couple of people ask us, and we do advise them. But what we do do is we go up and down the country and we do, um, we 
uh, encourage youngsters and we um, uh, give them sort of not TED talks, but you know, yeah, explain to them a bit more about hospitality and where their futures could take them. Where their appetites, well, so to and speak. the career path yeah. that they could be on. Um, I spend my life lobbying for hospitality. So any politician that I meet, any captain of industry, I'm straight on them and I jump down their throats immediately about <laughs> hospitality and how we need and well, what we must have yeah. and why don't we have this. this and sounds blog- like another podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great. So that's what I do a lot of the time yeah. is lobby for hospitality. Yeah. Um, with anyone I can. Luckily, um, or, or on the, the radio on LBC mm. um, with James O'Brien, who luckily is a, he's a family friend of ours. So I'm very lucky that he gives me a platform every now and again to bang on about hospitality mm-hmm. and to um, encourage people into this industry. For us, one of the biggest points is not so much, as, as Sergio said, once the kids are in the industry, they discover a whole new world. And it's like a, a, a sort of a wonderland of things that they could do and the, the prospects that you could have. Mm-hmm. If you want to end up running your own pub in the Cotswolds, great. If you want to be the manager of Claridge's, great. Well, all of that is part of hospitality yeah, and it's absolutely. up to you to go out and get it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, you can only, and you can only run these competitions uh, with a group of people that are like-minded. Yeah. Uh, um, I've been running the... Uh, annual awards of excellence for close to 40 years now, which is a long time. Uh, but, you know, myself and my colleagues, uh, fellow trustees at the uh, World Service Scholarship, give the time for free mm-hmm. to do this. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, big, it's a big investment in time. But I can honestly say that the uh, pleasure that you get by meeting this amazing talent there is in the UK yeah. Every time we have a competition, mm-hmm. it's a big payback. Mm. Um, and I find that frustrating that perhaps as an industry, we are a bit too uh, secretive about what we offer. We're not out there uh, enough. Uh, we, don't, we haven't found a way of encouraging parents mm. to That's ensure yeah. that their children consider hospitality mm. as a career. So on that point, yes. how would you, what would you say to that? I always say to them, it's my hobby horse now, <laughs> hospitality is what, name me another profession in the world where it doesn't matter what size you are, what colour you are, what religion you are, what sex you are, what sexuality you are, what age you are. Mm. You can walk into a job anytime and we will pay you to do it. If you want to be a teacher, as Sergio said, if you want to be a teacher, you have to, it costs you money to yeah. um, train to be a teacher. If you want to be a nurse, there are no nursing bursaries mm-hmm. anymore. You have to pay for your own training. In hospitality, you learn on the job from the get-go. And there are no barriers to anyone coming in and achieving anything that they want. You can, if you're Bored of the weather in England, you can go to Heathrow on the tube, get on the plane, as long as the tube's working. Um, <laughs> uh, Gatwick Express wasn't working yesterday. Yeah, um, You can get on a plane, land anywhere in the world, mm-hmm. and by six o'clock yeah. tonight, you will have a job. Mm. And if you have a job, you will be able to find yourself lodgings and you will be able to eat and you will be able to develop a career somewhere completely differently Mm -hmm. until you've had enough of that country and you can then go somewhere else. What other profession gives you this? Yeah. And all this thing about, oh, well, catering, it's very badly paid. You know, I wouldn't want my job. Very badly paid. I Seriously, that's another plus that came out of COVID. uh, Yes, yes. I think that, yeah, I think that we, I mean, I told you about the uh, the Mm. introduction of service charge. It was uh, something that was needed because to guarantee people a distant wage for Mm. the job they were doing. I think that after COVID now, when we've had to readjust so much um, and we've done it well, uh, extremely well, I think. Uh, and I appreciate there's been a selection, perhaps, since some places have uh, gone by the wayside, which is sad. However, 
uh, I think that the next step in order to uh, make sure that this profession is appreciated, and I'm really targeting parents at this, our people in hospitality are by and large well paid, mm -hmm. really well paid mm -hmm. compared to other professions. Uh, and people who get to the top of our profession are extremely well paid and they, they uh, match salaries of uh, surgeons, doctors or whatever. Certainly more than MPs who are moaning about not having <laughs> enough money at the moment. Yeah. Get far too much for what they do. Uh, <laughs> however, I think that um, the pay structure and the way that we re remunerate people is so antiquated uh, that it now needs to be revised. And un unless employers um, get on board in understanding that they, we need to offer a salary to people. In my view, service tips is something that it's dragging our industry backwards, not forwards. Our professional people do a job. When you do a job, you get a salary. Mm -hmm. You don't need to, the salary to be made up of service charge, tips, or what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a salary. I am totally conversed on that and appreciate that if you were to pay a salary, it would mean uh, a financial uh, um, loss investment uh, on, on, on the employer's side. But, you know, uh, national insurance now has come down. There is talk that will be eliminated altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's only by a certain part. It's not might not happen. But I think it's principle that when you have a child who wants to join hospitality, or maybe you might want him to join hospitality or her, that you say, fine, you start off as a commie waiter and your starting wage will be £30,000. Mm -hmm. I'm only quoting figures. I know that some places in London pay more. Uh, and when you... Then you become a, uh, a waiter. I wish we could find another name for waiter because it really irks me when I say waiter because uh, it has such wrong connotation. I don't know why. Don't ask me why, but it does in my mind. But a waiter, chef de rang, then gets 45,000 pounds. You become a head waiter, you get 50, 60,000 pounds, 75,000 pounds, mm -hmm. sommelier, barman. Now, we all know these wages within the industry, but I challenge you, if you ask a parent anywhere in the UK and you say, please give me a scale of payment in hospitality, mm. what do you think a uh, commie waiter earns, a waiter, head waiter, sommelier, barman? I don't think they will ever clue. No, I yeah, mm. probably so agree. Yeah. Our profession, any profession, needs to be remunerated accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is an easy win, but it takes a bit of courage with somebody to say, I'm going to be the first person that I'm going to eliminate service charge. I don't want to have about tips. Mm -hmm. My people will earn so much, and that's how I do it. Everybody will follow. Mm -hmm. It just need that person. So that's my crusade. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're We've... in a we're in a ta sorry, Chun -chun. we're in a taxi the other day, and a black cab. And when we got out, he wouldn't take a tip. He said, well, I, you've paid the fare. Mm. That was the fare. The fare's the fare. I don't need a tip for doing my job. And we thought, oh, yes. <laughs> Abs. And mm. this is the way we see things going. And as Sergio said, all the employers out there are going to be thinking, <laughs> oh, my God, I can't believe they've just said that. Don't they know what they're doing to my business? But we have been in your shoes. So when we say it, it is a considered statement. Mm -hmm. It's not just an airy fairy wish. We'll continue this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Absolutely. So yeah. Come moving on. on. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're working for you. Mm -hmm. um, David. Three non negotiables. Yeah. Three non negotiables. Non negotiables. Yeah. Three. Well, sort of good negoti non negotiables or bad ones. I mean, good well, ones. What? Good ones is easy because it, good ones is um, my father's mantra was always consistency, consistency, consistency. So there's <laughs> three wow. words, might be the same that. word. Oh, yeah, so yeah. that's a, a strong, that's a plus. Yeah. But from the negative side, 
non-negotiables, i.e. things that I wouldn't put up with. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't put up with apathy. I find infuriating. Mm. If you don't want to be here, go somewhere else. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So apathy, selfishness and dishonesty. Yeah. Yeah. And by selfishness, I mean, it's not about you. The minute you set foot through the door, you are part yeah. of a team. And Absolutely. again, if you don't want to be a team player, go and be on your own somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So those would mm. be my three negative mm, non-negotiables. I, I yeah. I love doing this part <laughs> of the podcast. Because, you know, we, we've done a few, haven't we? And yeah. they're always different. Yeah. And I just nod and I go, yes, that is essential. <laughs> so I don't know how many non-negotiables I have now, but, well, you know, I, when, loads. When, when, I, when I didn't mind, the list was too long. I was it too long? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. that's good. Well, I mean, yeah. there are a lot of not, <laughs> non-negotiable, definitely. I think that mm. um, rudeness yeah. is mm-hmm. not Absolutely. something we can be tolerated, you know. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, not being caring, mm. I can't tolerate that. I can excuse uh, lack of knowledge mm-hmm. as long as it is a person is warm, wanted to help, is pleasant, yeah. is smiling, is uh, uh, gives love. That's fine. I, I can excuse anything, but rudeness and and uh, um, not recognizing the value of customers. I think to me, it's just totally, I can't, I just, Mm -hmm. because they pay our wages. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are not uh, uh, imposed to work anywhere. We can work out anytime we want. So uh, I think if we are there, we're there. And going back to going on stage, you know, when you go to a theater, you want, you expect the the, the actors on stage (laughs) and the production to, to give you what you paid for and to to leave you with memories mm. and if you can't provide those you know you're wasting your time big time mm. and us the customer mm. is not the enemy by any means it's you know the they no, are what we're all there the, for the aren't we money as a business. yeah we're, we're, you know <laughs> and but also you know that's tree. why you do yeah. service isn't it that you want yes. to you know Please others yes. and make their time a good one. Your while, salary while doesn't working. come for your employer. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does, Absolutely. but indirectly, you know, it's the customer who pays yeah. for your salary. So we must mm-hmm. never forget that when we're there. But mm-hmm. pedantic and basics, however. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm just going back to what you said um, about always saying yes, and I, I remember um, when I first started. The square and David and I had newly started working together, and I just put down the phone and I think I'd uh, we hadn't had space to fit someone in or something, and he he said and he said to me, um, why did you say no? He said it should always be yes, and mm. I just went, of course it should be. You and know, then you find a yeah. solution later, and then you find a solution later, yes. and it was like actually like completely. Uh, yeah, something else to and think about, wasn't it? The skill it was like... of the receptionist—that's another <laughs> one of my missions you know? to bring back the receptionist. Yeah, yes. because the receptionist is such an important. Well, it's very part true. When I first started mm. as manager, I was very young at Shea Bruce, and I was appointed as manager, but I had no clue how to do reception, and you had to learn on the job. Yeah, um, and I've realised over the years that it is probably one of the most important aspects. Mm. Um, well, it's the first point of contact that the customer yes. has with the restaurant. Not mm. press one, press two, press three, or mm. ticking times and dates on a on a, a, a res- resi reservation or yeah, you know on yeah. your phone or whatever. The first person that you come in contact with is the person who answers the mm-hmm. phone, mm-hmm. and that person will then become should become an important part of your experience yeah. every time. They should be able to recognize your voice and remember you and becomes a much friendlier conversation. Yeah. Or even if it doesn't even get to that point when someone rings and you are full and you can't fit them in, there are ways of saying, I can't fit you in. There are ways of, you know, mm. trying mm. to let people down gently. And you can only do that with a personal relationship rather than. There's trust speech. there, isn't there? Yeah. Especially yeah. if they've spoken to you before, yeah. that you know that you're you definitely can't fit them yeah. in, you know, because <laughs> they know that they trust you. Yeah. 
But yeah, and it was particularly important where we were in Bedlam because the reception desk is kind of in the middle of the mm. restaurant. So largely people would, if they couldn't find a, a, a manager or something, they would they'd come to me and they yeah. go, oh no, this has happened. Yeah. So it was um, quite a few, bit of time finding solutions. I think that was, that's also the beauty of, of service for yeah. me is, is not just mm. saying no, saying yes to oh, sometimes yes. really, you know, um, kind of unusual requests as well. Mm. Like, you know, I remember a couple of times popping out and doing some dry cleaning for various <laughs> various customers yeah. who'd uh, accidentally dropped their dish on top yes, of themselves yeah. or All something. Sorts of stuff. Or, uh, mopping you people know. up, sorting people out, bandaging yeah. people's knees when uh, they've fallen out of yeah. taxis. Find, finding yeah. them in the street when they're lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. We're here. Uh, yes. Yeah. All yeah. sorts. I mean, that, that's... that's yeah. All yeah. part of that. I read the other day. I think mm. it might have been in one of in in maybe in Giles Corrin's um, one of his uh, uh, articles. Uh, and Giles is another one who who grew up within our restaurants because his parents used to come to the restaurant, and mm. then they came so often they became yeah. friends with my parents, and then they bought a house in the south of France near my parents, so they would see each other out. Of, so Giles grew up through that, mm-hmm. and. He said to me, in fact, quite recently, um, that uh, hearing all these stories about magical restaurants and gastronomy and all that is one of the things that pushed him into the line of work that he's in now. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I read in his one of his review recently of the Dover that one of the most exciting things is that they have an old fashioned hard copy book <laughs> that they write everybody's <laughs> reservation down in. And they have wow. a list. And we used to have for mm. years, we had lists yeah. every year. You get your new reservations diary. So it was like a a sort of a mm. history of your restaurant, yeah. a potted yeah. history of your restaurant in great big books. Do you still mm. have those? <laughs> I don't know. You know, for years yeah, I used to collect, way. maybe mummy. No, mummy's a big chucker out of <laughs> stuff, so I'm not quite sure. But for years I used to, Isa and I used to collect um, names of customers, funny names. We used to write them down on a piece of paper and collect those. (laughs) I don't. Right. Uh, Yes. So, um, is there anything that you'd like to ask us? Well, we'd very much like to know about your new restaurant because there's nothing more exciting than opening a new restaurant. Yeah, absolutely. There's no one listening, is there? No. (laughs) Just between these four walls and the four of us, because personally, I find opening a new restaurant. Yeah. Fantastically interesting. Mm. I mean, everything from, I think we've discussed this from before, everything from um, extraction and plumbing and electricity to mm. what colour grout is going to be in the kitchen or, or wherever. I mean, I just, to me, that's just... Yeah, come on, give us a sneak preview. Come well, um, we've had Medler for 13 years and we've just mm. signed a lease on a new restaurant in Belgravia in Eccleston Yards. Mm-hmm. Um, Grosvenor Estates mm-hmm. is the landlord. Uh, it's a shell unit, a rooftop space with a roof terrace. And we're currently getting it ready to be a fantastic addition to the London restaurant scene. Lovely. Are we, are we going similar style or are you doing something? I mean, culinary style, is it going to be? Uh, it's, uh, it will be different to Medla. Mm-hmm. We have, so, uh, we're keeping the team at Medla and mm-hmm. we're creating a whole new team and different chef involved. And I think it will be uh, a high-end restaurant. Okay, fantastic. Induction kitchen? Induction kitchen, yes. Uh, that was part of the uh, lease, actually. We couldn't have gas in there, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. <laughs> I bet. Oh, I'm hungry. Yes. At the moment, it's all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but this is like, um, uh, these are s- very exciting times because yeah. all your dreams, all your expectations are all yes. there and just, well, my vision, my vision of the restaurants is there, but at the moment it's all about trying to get it done on budget and yes. and getting everything aligned and the builders and mm. all this kind of stress which at the is, moment. Which is very difficult uh, and yes. very stressful. It is, yeah. yes. So uh, once we get open, I think then it's about getting the, you know, the goal, the vision of the restaurant in, into reality. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Lovely. Mm. Shall we finish, David, with the uh, five, yeah, some quick fire questions? The quick fire. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Ready? Go. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I can be quick. As you found out, I can talk for England, so I don't know if I do. To quick, be fair, but... every time we've done this, it's not been very quick because we go off on tangents. <laughs> right, okay, we go, okay. oh yeah, okay. that's great. Yes, so sure. yeah. Yes. Best service ever received. Oh, easy. 
um, Landlume recently and the Ritz. The Ritz because it's very traditional mm -hmm. uh, and you can tell that uh, it's a one word answer. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that the amazing work that John Williams and Simon Girling are doing yeah. uh, in, in providing the backbone of everything mm -hmm. uh, that are Pure hospitality yeah. and tradition yeah. stands for yeah. is superlative. Mm. Right. Lanclum, because it's a very relaxed uh, service for a three Muslim star restaurant. On the face of it, it's a mm. very relaxed service. And, uh, mm. But there's, mm. been, going on. there's been no simple things are yeah. the most difficult mm -hmm. thing to, to get right. Yes. Uh, but what I liked about uh, Lanclum is that every there were no sections and every member of staff that walked by a table, if that table needed something, that, did stuff, that person did it. Yeah. Mm. It wasn't left to, it just, it just happened. I'm not the sommelier. I no. don't pick up wine no. glasses. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, you do. If you see a wine glass that is empty, you remove it. And if it needs topping but, up, you top yeah. it up. But yeah. it, it was done with, uh, with brio, with charm. Mm -hmm. And it was like... It was like watching a ballet, actually. Yeah, it, was, mm. it was wonderful. Wonderful experience. Mm. Yes. Mm. That is not to say that there are so many other... You know, it's, that question is a difficult question to, to, sure. to answer. I'm sure there are many other uh, yeah. wonderful establishments who have exactly equally good service. Mm. Yes. However, one doesn't visit every establishment. Yeah, that, so that, kind of, that was very refreshing experience. for us and that mm. blew us away because we work a lot with the Ritz and we work a lot with... Um, Glen Eagles. And those mm. are the two, if you like, the, the equivalents of, in Europe, they have uh, EHL, they call Hotelier de Lausanne, mm. which everybody yes. um, aspires to go to if they can afford to. That is the peak of culinary training in Europe. In this country, we have two extraordinary training boot camps. One is the Ritz and one is Glen Eagles. Mm -hmm. And what's more, again, you get paid when you go and work there. So you learn the job from the ground up to perfection mm -hmm. and you get employed and paid at the same time. Yeah. And do you, do you want to add to that, Natasha? Service? <laughs> well, add more. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone in our industry that inspires you? Um, oh gosh, many people have inspired me over the years. Um, the three principal people I can think of are, are no longer around, but I have to mention Alan Crompton Bat because without Alan Crompton Bat, he is the person who started Restaurant PR. Mm -hmm. And without him, none of us would be where we are today. And the joy and the fun and the buzz of eating out and reading about new restaurants in every color supplement every mm -hmm. weekend, none of that would have happened without Alan Crompton Bat. And he was extraordinary. And another person who touched me very greatly was David Collins. Mm -hmm. And as I said previously, uh, I had studied art and design and then got sucked back into restaurants. And um, he designed two restaurants for us. And when he designed the first one, Incognito, working with David Collins was like, oh my God, it was just amazing. And being able to express my artistic side within interior design and he even offered me a job at one stage which was amazing for me it was yeah. it's like you know it's it's as if Martin Scorsese offers you a part in one of his films I mean it's that <laughs> that sort of and I didn't take it and I didn't move and I stayed at Shane Nicol but yes. that was a highlight yeah. and David Collins was an amazing person who, again, changed the face of restaurants in this town and therefore in this country, um, adding the, the beauty and the wow factor mm. of an interior-designed restaurant, a stylish restaurant, making the restaurant, the, the beauty of the room, part of why people wanted to come, that was him, and he started mm. that. And the third person? You said the third three. person. <laughs> Well, the, the third person was an American chap called Bob Payton, who um, became one of my father's greatest friends. And Bob Payton was an advertising man. So he was huge, big, larger than life. You're, if you like, your stereotypical American. Um, 
But he came to the industry with his advertising and marketing background also. So he brought a new element to things. And he uh, brought deep dish pizza to England because that's what he'd been used to (laughs) in Chicago, where he was from. Um, And they didn't have it here. He was working at J. Walter Thompson and um, must have got bored and wanted a career change and thought, you know what? They don't have good pizza here. I'm going to bring pizza. (laughs) And he brought that sort of can-do, larger-than-life atmosphere, American way of doing things to the catering industry and to hospitality in London. And he went on to open... Um, the Chicago Rib Shack and all of these things, which in yeah. their day were huge and groundbreaking and different and new. Excellent. Mm. Sergio, anyone you want to mention? Uh, well, certainly uh, um, Lord Forte was a big influence. Yes. Sure. Uh, and because of his support, mm. uh, because his way of teaching me so many things that... Um, his humility, even though he was such a person who owns over a thousand hotels. And and I, I always forget that when we opened the wife and I was at an English restaurant, uh, we had lots of dignitaries, mayors, and so on. And then, so obviously, he said hello to all of them. Then I said, Sergio, do me a favor. Can you please take me to the uh, kitchen? So he went to the kitchen and uh, he went to sit with the chef. Then he went to the pot wash and he went. He wanted the photo to be taken with all the people in the pot wash. Mm. And of course, we had the photo at times. Yeah. So the following week, Lord Forte in the pot wash with all people in the pot wash around him. And that's really lovely. You know, yeah. and I thought, mm. simple, clever, without the pot wash, we can't run a restaurant. No. And so that taught me so much mm. uh, on a human level. A great person. And, you know, then his son, Sir Rock, was taken over. Uh, as a wonderful company with exclusive hotels. Uh, his family are working in the business, his two daughters and his son. And Lydia Forte is one of our trustees at the Good Service Scholarship. So, again, the memo is created and mm. the way that it's yeah. progressed. And Charles Allen, Charles Allen is not uh, a figure in industry because he was Granada TV, uh, is now chairman of Global, multi radio station. but one thing I learned from Charles is that um, we had a chat once and I, I, we, we ran a, a business center at Gorma House with 21 rooms. And he said to me, what is your room hire rate? So I told him. And he said, and is that, does it change? Is it this, no, it's the same, but we, we review it every six months or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, he said. Well, you know, in television, we have prime time, mm. medium time, low times. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, fine. Got the message. So yes, I mean th- these are lessons that you that you that you that you remember mm-hmm. and that you maximize uh, what you do at certain times. And there are other times when you can't and you have to do something else too. Uh, so that was a very quick, easy lesson. Mm. Um, yeah. So those are those are and. We, we talked a lot about things that we do, I did, or I still do, but it wouldn't be uh, the fellow trustees that I have, the people at the Academy of Culinary Arts, uh, that give the time free. I mean, they, they are inspirational. They are the people who want you to do it because, again, it's a team. It's not just on your own. It's not a single crusade, uh, even though we all have single crusades, but together. We just want the best for the industry and to really bring young people in. Mm. Yeah. They inspire me, the young yeah. people who enter our competitions. Yes. Yeah. Because you need, you, you really need courage, particularly at a young age, to enter a competition out of nowhere. And they give me so much hope because ah. we're, we're, every year we, are, um, we meet about 200 new youngsters between both competitions. And that whittles down to, and particularly towards um, the semi-finals and the finals of the Gold Mm. Service Scholarship and the winning finals of the Gold Service Scholarship, you become very, very close to these people. And they give me hope. And Mm. everybody moans about young people, and they don't do this, they don't do that. Oh, in my day. (laughs) (laughs) 
That is so not true. Our industry yeah. is in safe hands. They yeah. are outstanding, Absolutely. exceptional mm. young people who love what they do and will keep our industry going. I mean, a fellow does the uh, uh, Edward Griffiths um, um, that, you know, he was a with the royal household. Mm. And that has opened another area that we were not mm. exposed to. Yes. Uh, and it was wonderful that one of the um, one of the um, footmen became scholar, uh, uh, and 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 every year there were so many people partaking mm. because they are uh, they are hospitality on the highest level. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and to to look after the king, the queen, uh, uh, it's incredible. I certainly know how I felt when when the queen came to Ninety Park mm-hmm. Lane. And she and she was a guest of somebody, mm-hmm. uh, and how wonderful it, it was to be able to look after her, uh, and and what an amazing person she is, and having had the pleasure of meeting her a couple of times, just uh, she she's an inspiration, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. But that goes for so many people in this mm-hmm. in the UK, mm-hmm. not just me. Yeah. Mm. So, is there a book that inspires you? Oh, easy for me. <sighs> Go ahead then. My Gastronomy by Nicola Dennis. Chapter one in particular of that book, I challenge you to find a more beautiful opening chapter mm. to any book it's in literature. It's on my literature. shelf, we can get it later. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. There is no better opening chapter to any book in yeah. literature in the English language. No, I, I, um, I I concur. and I, 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 Not because of the relationship, but mm. uh, Nico is an amazing man. Uh, he, he had a gift, mm-hmm. a gift of smell and taste that God gave, gave him. Mm. He, didn't, he didn't learn it from anywhere else. And it was just unique. I, uh, I saw a medieval book called Intranchante, uh, which taught about, uh, teaches about carving of all sorts of birds and animals mm-hmm. in, in the Middle Ages. I just thought it was fascinating. Uh, and I also liked uh, what Anthony Bourdain uh, yeah. in America did uh, in in bringing uh, our industry into a novel sort of situation mm-hmm. yeah. where mm-hmm. it uh, gave you an insight of what happens good mm-hmm. and bad <laughs> but uh, uh, but it, it it was it's another way of communicating isn't sure. it and yeah. yes. letting people know what our industry is like uh, favorite wine <laughs> favorite wine favorite wine or Again, co- I will easy. take cocktail as well oh, good Not, absolutely yes I absolutely. have tart taste when it comes to drinks <laughs> anything sweet yes so uh, a sweet wine or demi sec champagne mm. would be my drink of choice but a cocktail if you're mm. offering would be exactly <laughs> <laughs> for me yes well I mean what are we eating ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, right yes you must have of course in your head yeah. straight away when you um, yeah. no. I, I I like Condrieu, uh-huh. mm-hmm. um, um, but you know, really, it's it really depends on, on the mood, because mm. uh, Condrieu doesn't f- suit every mood, mm-hmm. definitely doesn't suit every food I eat. Uh, so it depends on the mood. But I'm I'm a lover of wines. Okay, uh, I'm not definitely. a big lover of champagne. I have to say, I find it totally overrated, and sometimes it's I think it's actually just fizzy battery acid. But that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> and was, oh yes, champagne. And I would really be interested to know how many people actually really like champagne. But anyway. I, I really love champagne. Yeah, okay, yeah, really I was about champagne. to say, yeah. I, I was about to qualify yeah, that. He also drinks battery acid. Yeah. <laughs> and I really like Laurent Perrier. Seems unlikely, okay. doesn't it? So you know, okay. But yeah. I was about to say that we did in in um in Great Portland Street, we did a dinner for Remy Krug. Yes. Years ago, and I had the opportunity of tasting proper champagne. Mm. And I remember drinking mm. a 61 Krug, which I will never be able to drink again. And it was dark yellow, almost brown, and almost flat, mm. and tasted of sherry. Mm. And it was delicious, mm. absolutely delicious. So within the battery acid range, <laughs> There are. I was about to say, yeah. <laughs> so there is some champagne so that you'll there accept. Is some that I will. You just have. A, yes, absolutely. I very will. high standards. Correct. <laughs> Always. Lovely. Gold okay. service has to be. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So best place, best place of food. Best plate of food, again, very simple. Anything that my dad cooked, yeah. he had magic hands, a golden palate, which I'm very glad that I inherited his his palate. Um, so anything he made, outstanding, unbeatable, can never be reproduced. Again, it's an impossible question to yeah. answer, but <laughs> what, what comes to mind is uh, Brouillard de Truff. At La Petite Maison in Nice. Oh, yes. That was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your dad, uh, Poulet of so Jeune. Yes. Yeah. Out, yeah. out of this world. Well, anything, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you know, it's an impossible question to yeah. answer, but those... A few of sp- these are quite difficult, aren't spring, they? Because it's to hard mind. to narrow it down. Yeah, spring yeah. to mind. Because yeah. uh, I'm sure that when you reflect and you say, oh, oh yeah. my God, I forgot that. Yeah. Because that yeah, was a wonderful experience. It. Well, it's like yeah. when they say... Um, uh, your last meal, your execution. <laughs> you know, what would that be? And you go, well, I think I'd have truffles. Oh, yeah. I did. Can you really beat a crumpet with butter and marmite? I'm yeah. not sure. Maybe Mine not. would be a very long menu. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep going. But you know, my 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 aunt, my aunt used to do a guinea fowl. Yeah. Mm. I hosted guinea fowl with rosemary, quite plain, but she used to extract the flavors mm. of this. And you know, these flavors are. Somewhere in the memory oh, yeah. box there. Yeah, yeah. And mm. when you, sometimes you have guinea fowl or rabbit and you say, oh my God, the, the memory box opens up. You say, yeah, you remember oh, yeah. this? You had this before. Sergio makes it was, it, and, it, yeah. and, it, and it was amazing. <laughs> so yes, I mean, it's impossible question to ask about many, many things. Yeah. So my turn. Go on then. Oh, go on then. <laughs> um, easy meal at home. Again, uh, easy. If I'm at my crumpet, mother's home, uh, crumpet, the, crumpet. yeah, yeah, crumpet crumpet with my, with my yeah, no. If I'm at my mother's home, <laughs> yes. open the fridge and just eat anything she's cooked. She is oh. a fantastic cook. So anything my mum makes, nice. I'm there. Um, it has to be spaghetti aglio olio ah. e peperoncino <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. uh, um, when you when you you want something that it's pleasing, it's quick. Uh, Wakes up all the flavors and you knock it up in 15 minutes yeah. mm. max. Job yeah. done. And, and mm. it's fantastic. Brilliant. Sergio and Natasha, yeah, it's thank been you so much. Fascinating <laughs> listening to some yeah. this morning. Been a pleasure talking to yeah. you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much for so having much. us. Thanks for joining us. Oh. Well, <laughs> it's been lovely to have you both as well, like our first double act. So <laughs> it's been yeah. great. Thank you very much. Honestly, Not at it's, all. Um, Wonderful. Really I told you we were a twofer. I know. It's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Drive for Service podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Medler Chelsea and make sure that you like and subscribe for future episodes. <laughs>